Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to welcome Gabrielle Bullock tonight to present her work as an award-winning principal of Perkins and Will, where she is also the director of Global Diversity. In learning more about Bullock's incredible and inspiring trajectory as an architect and as a thought leader whose work is dedicated to fundamentally altering our disciplines and practices and their impact on the built environment, the words that emerge to describe her and her work are a powerful catalyst for change. Bullock has played a key role in Perkins and Will's success for over three decades, working in both the New York and Los Angeles studios where she became the first African-American and the first woman to rise to the position of managing director. During her tenure, she has led a number of the practice's most complex and high profile projects, including the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center, one of the largest building projects ever completed for the University of California system, and the King Saud bin Abdelaziz University for Health Sciences, amongst other. Bullock has also been able to combine her passions for architecture and social justice to effect positive change. The impact has been palpable. Her unique role as the firm's director of global diversity, which she has held since 2013, was an industry first. Her appointment quickly set off a wave of similar roles, programs, and initiatives across the design profession designed to support and promote diversity on both a micro, micro and macro level, both in and out of the studio. Bullock has become a sought after speaker and educator on issues related to social equity and in design, including race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and physical and mental ability. I quote her, the work we do is directly tied to cultural differences. Bullock said at her induction ceremony to the IIDA's international board for which she serves as president. That's why, quote, the design profession should mirror the community and clients we serve. We change what we design by who designs it, end of quote. This mirroring and impact is most clearly visible in her current project, Destination Crenshaw, a 1.3 mile open air space that will serve as an art museum and cultural center for West Central Los Angeles, conceived as a series of community spaces, including an outdoor amphitheater, parks and works by black artists to reinvigorate the area and celebrate black Los Angeles. Bullock has also been an important voice for AIA's Equity and Architecture Commission and its Diversity Council, driving the implementation of critical program and policy changes such as AIA Resolution 18.3, Diversity Pipeline and National Representation. She has been a captivating speaker at engagements such as the, the 2019 AIA Women's Leadership Summit, 2019 Encompass, Inclusive Architecture Conference and AIA 2015 powerful Women Leading Design Symposium. Bullock was awarded the prestigious Whitney M. Young Award in 2020, named for civil rights leader Whitney Young Jr. This award distinguishes an architect or architectural organization that embodies social responsibility and actively addresses a relevant issue such as affordable housing, inclusiveness, or universal access. Bullock graduated in 1984 from the Rhode Island School of Design with degrees in fine arts and architecture, becoming the second black woman to earn an architecture degree from that university. Please join me in welcoming Gabrielle Bullock, as well as our very own Juan Herreros, who has led the thinking about constructing new modes of engaged practices over the years here at GSAP, and who will give the response this evening. I'm really looking forward to uh, the work and the conversation. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you tonight. The title of my lecture is Beyond Do No Harm, Visionary Design and Practice Solutions Through the JEDI Lens. JEDI is Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. To me, this means transformation now. Uh, we've galvanized in the past with our profession many years ago to address the environmental crisis and focus on a more sustainable approach to design. We changed codes, municipal mandates, zoning and land use, and even, even our office cultures. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'll use my, um, I'm so sorry. Well, today and for decades, we are faced with another environmental crisis, the human crisis, sustainability and resilience of our communities. 
the fragile social infrastructure of our environment. I'll use my story to demonstrate the sense of urgency for a trans transformation toward a more equitable and representative industry. From my dream as a 12 year old, my journey through design school and career trajectory focused on purpose, purpose-driven work and practice. So I got to start at the beginning. So I'm a city girl. I grew up in New York City, born in Harlem and raised in the Bronx. It was a multicultural city, urban center. I went to the High School of Music and Art, which was a creative community, diverse and inclusive. I felt, you know, there was belonging, yet you could be an individual. I was raised by a family of strong, supportive women who taught me I could do anything. I put my mind to it. And I'm also the first generation college grad. So at 12, I realized instinctively that the inequities of living conditions of black and brown communities was, uh, was inequitable and it was um, actually not very humane. And that's why I wanted to become an architect. I believe that everyone deserves a beautiful, beautiful and humane place to live. So it was a reaction to public housing like this, and this is actually not a bad looking one, um, and how, how they didn't perpetuate pride, ownership, ownership, happiness, or well-being. So I wanted to become an architect to improve the way my people lived, believing that everyone deserved a beautiful place to live. So off I go to RISD in 1979, and I can't talk about where I am today without going back to my time at RISD, my architecture education. My expectation coming from high school like music and art, a city like New York, that it would be, you know, as creative, as diverse. Well, it wasn't. It was sort of a culture shock. The lack of diversity among students, among faculty, lack of an inclusive curriculum. I didn't see me or my lived experiences represented in the curriculum. While we were provided the foundation and critical skills of design, it was represented through a white Eurocentric lens, focused largely on examples of iconic architects, architects, and individual genius. Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright, Philip Johnson, Louis Kahn, and it goes on and on. It wasn't until I think Maya Lin who was probably my second to last year, 83 or 84, where Maya Lin was a student, um, I forget where she went, but at the time she won the Vietnam Memorial um, Project. And I remember it vividly as an example of cultural and social influence, a sort of remembrance design. And so I finally connected with a project, an example of a project of what we could do to have social impact and connection. Then there was the architectural jargon, which I made little sense to me, but I powered through. What I didn't, what I wasn't exposed to are architects like Paul Revere Williams or Norma Sklarik. And while I've, I had heard of Max Bond and had a friend who worked for him, I was not exposed to architects of color, African-American architects. And they say, if you can see it, you can be it. My thesis was housing in Harlem. Um, I set out to focus on, on, on housing. And so I did it finally in my thesis um, and felt pretty proud about it. As, as my bio says, I, I was the second black woman to graduate from RISD's architecture department. And in spite of the homogeneous nature of academia and professional practice back then, I absorbed the knowledge, the skill, and learned all the rules because I really thought those were the rules and the lingo so I could pursue and achieve my aspirations and then finally break the rules. You know, the issues of issues facing women and people of color, the only one in the room is real and it's been real for a long time. I think we are making some progress, but, you know, being the only one of anything, a woman, 
um, LGBTQ, um, youngest person in the room, oldest person in the room. Um, it, it affects many of us differently. Some feel invisible. I've learned over the years that um, since I'm the only one in the room, I got the stage, I might as well use it. But not everybody is able to do that. I am one of 502 African-American women licensed architects in the US and that's 0.2%. This is one of the, you know, this was, it was not necessarily determined, a deterrent or a significant obstacle, but it has shaped my perspective and my goals and my drive to help transform our profession to be more inclusive and representational. After RISD, I worked for three small firms that did the kind of housing that I wanted to do. And it was the 80s and it was a recession. And so they all went belly up. They went out of business. So I found myself at a healthcare firm, which would, was on Sonder, which would become Perkins and Will. Whatever I was gonna do, I knew it had to have a purpose. This drive led me to designing hospitals, designing for hospitals, and eventually doing the work I do today, which I'll show you in a minute. So whether it's from the large um, medical center in UCLA, that's Ronald Reagan UCLA, or higher ed in Saudi Arabia, the first um, co-ed university, uh, uh, neurosciences, a, a pediatric hospital, to a simple facade um, improvement for an ambulatory care to a Girl Scout camp. All of these to me uh, serve a purpose, a larger purpose, a social purpose, and many of them came from connections. You know, I was um, on the board of the Girl Scouts, their, their camp burned down. So from a social responsibility project as master plan, we got the cabin and the dining hall. But I wanna go back to the, the really important projects in Saudi Arabia because this is where I um, really enjoyed the need, the necessity to research the culture. We did not necessarily represent the culture, but we knew it was very important in order to design an authentic response and an authentic design that we must research the culture in, in every way. And that's something that we worked hard to embed in our teams. It wasn't necessarily natural or the automatic, the, the typical way you would start a design, but it really represented the need for cultural competency. So in 2013, after completing the Saudi projects and transitioning from the managing director role, I decided it was time to help the firm really advance, put a stake in the ground to promote change in the profession around diversity, inclusion, and engagement. And my, my commitment went beyond the personal stature. Um, it was really um, an aspirate and beyond aspiration to make real action. I created the role, the diversity role, and strategy to transform Perkins and Will and the profession to be more diverse, inclusive, and engaged. And at the time, I had seen the impact when we don't consider cultural uniqueness of who we are designing for. That, along with being frustrated with being the only one in the room, and inequities abound in our profession. And when I proposed it, I said, well, I better have the reasons why it's imperative that we do this. And it wasn't hard to determine that there was a demographic imperative. Um, the, the, the diversity of our society was increasing. Um, uh, our, um, I'm sorry. And there, in the business imperative, there was research that the more diverse you are, the more profitable and productive you are. And then the humane, the human imperative was really strong and it's even stronger today. 
So we set out with, started with the mission that basically says that we feel that the more diverse we are, the more inclusive we are, the more successful we will be. And that we were, um, we wanted to reflect the diversity of the communities and clients we serve. And the whole strategy, and there's a uh, strategic plan around this whole, whole program around this, one pillar was to build the culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion within Perkins and Will. And then to establish it as a core value, design, sustainability, um, resiliency, all of these are core values and diversity and inclusion ought to be as, as at the same level. And then to build the pipeline to make sure that, that when we have conversations like this 10, 15 years from now, there's more than 502 of me and there's more women and there's more, um, more representation across the board from school to practice. And then finally, to lead the way for our industry um, to become, for the entire industry to become more diverse and inclusive. That went really fine. And we worked hard to develop programs and strategies and build it up not only from the top down, but from the bottom up with our staff. And then fast forward to last year. And honestly, having, uh, having been doing this since 2013, it wasn't until last year or late 2019 that we really, we said we have to focus on uh, Jedi or diversity and inclusion in our work. Building the culture of the, of the practice is one thing, but how do we translate this into our work? Well, the events of last year um, really gave us um, the impetus, the, the push to really focus on it and challenge the status quo. It's about challenging the status quo and practice and culture to tear down those barriers and build a more just and equitable society. And why now? Why equity and community? Why equity and design? Well, again, I think the pandemic really shined a light on the disproportional, disproportionate impact on marginalized communities of people of color. Hispanics die two almost two and a half times more than white people, African-Americans a little less than two. So the, and if they are, if those communities are the essential workers, um, they are our, our, our social infrastructure. And some say, well, you know, it hit those communities hardest because they live in urban cities. Well, in fact, 56% of the world population lives in urban areas and they're not all dying. So it's more about, you know, the quality and the quality and quantity of affordable housing, the um, extended family um, situations among these populations, um, poverty, et cetera. So I think while this is a public health crisis primarily, Urban planning and design can mitigate its impact and address the issue of affordable um, housing, public transportation, green space, and walkable communities, all to strengthen the, the social infrastructure. Some of the inequities has to do with racism, structural and institutional racism, where um, the practices and policies have, have led to adverse outcomes and conditions for communities inadvertently uh, and detrimental to, to, to communities of color, like zoning and covenants. We have the opportunity to address these inequities with our clients, our projects by first understanding what they are, and then using our expertise um, and our cultural competency to help mitigate the impact on our, com our communities. And as I said, the pandemic revealed the level of, of impact, structural and institutional inequities on our most, most vulnerable communities. 
And then you can't, you know, if we look at this, I call it the web of oppression. You know, we tend to look at stay in our lane. We're going to look at the housing or we're going to look at health care, but we have to look at the entire web of the social systems. We see how the criminal justice system um, has impacted black and brown communities over decades. Um, the education system, uh, disparities in that, et cetera. So the problem of adapting the social system to its physical um, and social environment is probably not the right thing to do. Most important problem is, is, is in the respect of procuring resources needed for the activities of these systems and providing protection against physical and social threats. So how do we transform? In order to transform, it requires stepping out of our comfort zone, having the difficult conversations about race, exclusion, inequity, educate ourselves and learn what are the historic and current barriers, attitudes that perpetuate inequitable conditions. Understand the history of civil rights, segregation, urban renewal, gentrification, all of these things that I think up until last year, we were not all um, even slightly aware, right? Some are more aware and, and can speak to it, but I think it's, it's our responsibility to recognize our role as stewards in dismantling these barriers and embrace the full spectrum of our society through equitable design. These um, slides I'm going to show you about um, educating ourselves. This is something that we did firm-wide last summer, is to really communicate and educate the entire firm on what these barriers are so that we, um, so that we can address them. We, can, we know that they're there. We know how they got there. So the civil rights movement right, decades long struggle by African Americans and their like-minded allies to end institutional racial discrimination. We have urban renewal, the reclaiming for physical infrastructure, significant, um, sig significant reason why the extreme, I'm sorry, the extreme wealth gap occurs today. Urban renewal, um, degradation, uh, you know, the flight from the inner cities by, um, by the white community, depleting the tax base, leaving islands of poverty. So a lot of the conditions in communities of color, urban communities didn't just happen overnight. It's been systematic over time. So all of these things, planned shrinkage, are all important uh, points in history that have impacted um, our cities, our communities that we need to be aware of. And the one that most um, should be familiar to us is gentrification, displacement, and erasure. And so gentrification is the change of a character through influx of more affluent residents. In other words, you beautify a community and then um, the people that live there have to leave because the uh, prices went up of the of the real estate. Um, other people moved in for the same for the same reason why they were being beautified in the first place, probably art, culture, etc. <clears throat> so, as part of the education, I'm sure we've all read a whole bunch of books the last couple of months, last year. I find this one particularly um, helpful, and also one called "Palaces for the People" by Eric Kleinberg, which really talks about social infrastructure. So now I'm gonna share with you Destination Crenshaw, which I think is a case study, an example of these concepts and, and some more concepts uh, that, dem that, uh, that really address the equity in community and um, avoiding cultural erasure. So Destination Crenshaw is in South Los Angeles on Crenshaw Boulevard. We spent, oh, let me just explain. So the project was precipitated by the extension of the train system 
from the airport down at the bottom to all the way to downtown. And it goes through the Crenshaw district, which is the largest black community west of the Mississippi. And it's been there for, for decades. Um, part of the great migration from the South, many, um, many of the black community settled there. And as with major iconic commercial streets in, in Los Angeles, Sunset Boulevard, Wilshire Boulevard, the train is either below grade or elevated. Well, on this 1.3 mile stretch through the major commercial um, area of Crenshaw, it's at grade. And despite the, uh, the community's fight to have it either be elevated or below grade, um, it's, it's at great. So they decided in their words to make lemonade out of lemon. But this is an example of um, a half century of disinvestment in this community. And for Angelinos who ride the train at grade, you know, could provide a unique opportunity to get, um, to get riders to this area once we're done. And it, it would be a great experience. But the vision for Destination Crenshaw, it's an outdoor art and cultural experience and is dedicated to legitimizing and celebrating the culture of Crenshaw and thereby contributing, contributing to the overall health and sustainability of the neighborhood. It's to celebrate their heritage, leverage existing assets and create new experiences and also catalyze growth. The picture on the right is the Endeavor shuttle that was moved to Los Angeles to go to the Science Museum. While the Endeavor went down Crenshaw Boulevard, Crenshaw Boulevard is probably six lanes total, three in each direction, and they mowed down all of the trees along this boulevard to get the Endeavor to the Space Museum, to the Science Museum. So overall, our objectives were placekeeping, not placemaking. This place already exists. So it's placekeeping, um, engaging the community as a design partner, giving them design agency, avoid cultural erasure, be a partner, not a savior. And again, to, to, to be an economic catalyst and hopefully to be a um, an example, a model for social equity and black community revitalization for other cities. Perkins and Will was handpicked by the client for our cultural and civic experience and for the Atlanta Beltline because it's sort of a similar concept. But more importantly, aside from the expertise, Cultural competency, representation, and connection to the community was very important to them. Phil Freelon, the late Phil Freelon, um, was principal advisor. He and Zena both worked on the National Museum of African American History and Culture. The project manager, Drake Dillard, lives in the community. And then there's me. Um, so it was important for the client to have a shorthand trust amongst their team. So now I'll go into uh, a deep dive into the uh, concept of this project. So we spent, we engaged the committee, as I said, as a design partner. We had listening, so many, many listening sessions. They told us what they wanted for this project, what they wanted it to represent. They talked about the history of, of, of the community, of its residents, of its, of its legacy members. And it became clear that it was a resilient community. It may be small, but it was really strong. And so we looked at the giant star grass, which was used as um, bedding hay in slave ships. But it's a very hardy um, grass in the US. It's called Bermuda grass. 
and it's considered with promise and disdain because you can't kill it. So metaphorically, and the root system is horizontal, so it's a rhizome. And so it became the unifying theme for our design. It's small, strong root, hard to destroy, and survived in places that should have died. And I love this quote. A slum would endure if residents left as quickly as they could. A neighborhood could transform itself if people wanted to stay. It was the investment of time, money, and love that would make the difference. And that is our goal with Destination Crenshaw. So if you imagine this sort of um, figure ground of the 1.3 miles, and you'll see the cross sections of streets, imagine that as, as a root system, as the rhizome root system. And we took that and we used it at, we, at each intersection. We've come up with four modes of interpreting the experience. Improvisation at Slauson. Um, improvisation celebrates resourcefulness as the positive outcome of struggle. Uh, Nipsey Hussle, if you're familiar with Nipsey Hussle, he was um, a musician, a hip hop artist, had a store on Slauson. He was murdered several years ago. Um, first at 54th Street, first person stories of significant moments and historical firsts. Dreams at 50th Street celebrates the realm of daydreaming, the seemingly impossible aspirations free of constraints. And then finally to the right, which is the north, um, at the Mert Park is, is togetherness and it celebrates resilience of black culture born out of togetherness that is born uh, both ancestral and ongoing necessity. This experience is not meant to be chronological or you know, historical like, like you might see in some, we used to call this an uh, outdoor museum, but. So it is a multidisciplinary project, architecture, largely landscape, ur urban design, exhibit and interpret design, and of course, public art. But it's a series of pocket parks on both sides of the street um, that each tell a story through the design of the parks, the art that will be commissioned for each park, and they will all tell stories within those modes of interpretation that are unapologetically black, not LA, unapologet unapologetically black LA narratives. And the curation of the narratives is almost is as important as the curation of the landscape and the architecture and the art. Um, there will be about eight to 10 major artist permanent pieces, um, 50 plus murals and many other, you know, ways to engage local artists. It's meant to be a rotating art installation for the 2D work. Oh, at the south end, there'll be a sort of cultural campus. The train stop is right here. So once you get off the train, you'll see there's a um, historic fire station. We're taking over the entire uh, parking lot and creating a cultural center. All of these parks are either taken up um, space from uh, a local um, owner who's giving us access to their property. In some cases, it's a parking lot owned by the city, and in other cases, it's, um, it's in the public right of way. What's gonna connect all of this together for 1.3 miles, because it's likely that the parks will be phased, and so you don't wanna have um, you know, day one, when some of this opens, you want to be sure that there is a consistent um, story told, that it's evident. And so we're using the rhizome paving um, from the images I've showed the grass down here. It only goes in one direction. The little leaves will only go in one direction. That will run down in the paving the entire length of the boulevard. These shade structures are also part of the connective tissue 
as are the benches and the banners um, on the light poles and the um, storytelling panels on, on the shade structures. So those, that's the connective tissue. There will be um, areas for public art and public art project that will be inlaid in the paving um, at, at certain intervals down the boulevard. Now I'm going to go through some of the pocket parks. So as I said, this was this is in front of a um, a shopping center, and so we took a couple of parking stalls, but really didn't take up too much, and created a an area for art, which I cannot show you any of the art because <laughs> it's under wraps at the moment. Um, then there's, this would be the landmark, which is where the cultural campus will be. It'll have a 120 foot tall beacon lit up, um, engaging an artist at the base. The parking lot will be a park that will be used for many different programs. And again, that one was across the street from the, the train station. This pocket park is, um, a play park, we call it the I am park. And so it'll have play mounds. Um, every available wall will be used to commission an artist to create artwork wherever we can. And along the way, some of these parks are, you know, we use the terms pass linger, pass linger gather. So some parks are meant to rest a while, play, some are just passing by, and some are really meant to have full-on gatherings of a lot of people. Uh, programming will be very important. We've commandeered the wall of a, of a high school, Crenshaw High School, for a student art opportunity. We've created a park across the street from a wall that has been in existence since the 70s. I'll show you that in a minute. So that's the viewing platform for the wall that I'm going to show you right now. So this wall, I think you saw it in the when the Endeavor went past it. So this wall was created by community members many, many decades ago, and it's been maintained by those local artists on their own. So we're going to create a park just above it, restore it, and provide that viewing platform across the street. The, the last park is what I call the creme de la creme. It's Sankofa Park, and it's on the north end, and it serves as a unique location for community gatherings and a variety of public events. It'll feature a viewing platform that provides vistas overlooking Crenshaw Boulevard and the surrounding area. This is a view of the um, elevated portion. Sankofa means it's an African bird, and in some interpretations, and the bird can swing his neck around and look behind him. So one interpretation that I like says that the bird, you go back and get was, was yours, what was taken. So this is Sankofa Park, the largest of all of them. So when I talk about Sankofa, I mean, when I talk about the destination Crenshaw, people ask, so how do you know you'll be successful, right? And, you know, aside from negative gentrification, that's what we're really warding against. We're really trying to avoid cultural erasure by engaging the community every step away in a very robust way. But if it does become the iconic boulevard for visitors and investment, if, if it amplifies the Black culture and art to broader, broader audiences, and if it truly is a community asset and gathering space that offers intergenerational engagement and exchange, we will be successful. We will have been successful. The project is starting construction in a couple of months, a couple of weeks. Um, it'll probably be completed in 20, 2022, end of 2022. So that's Destination Crenshaw. My other role, let me just check time. I can't, I don't have a watch. Um, talk about practice and how we transform and advance our firms, schools of design and the industry. 
And I'll show you through the Perkins and Will lens and some of the efforts and things we have done. And it really is about the difficult conversations, challenging the status quo, focusing on cultural competency. Um, and so our basic um, philosophy or, or organization is that we have to address every aspect of what we do. Our partnerships, who, who our consultants are, who our clients are, our talent, our advocacy, be strong, be loud, be consistent, and, and most importantly is to take action. We have a structure um, and you know, there is a leader and there, we have a diversity council, uh, but the real work happens with our partners, which is marketing, human resources, um, public relations and our champions that are represented in each office. So over six, seven years, it's really become, as I said before, a really a weaved in approach and commitment. And many of our strategies come from local studios. We published a white paper with the AIA, so you all can access this. And it's, it's a white paper that talks about our structure and our um, um, things you might be able to do in your own organization. I think what's really important though is, you know, we can all put together a plan. We can say we wanna be more diverse and inclusive. We can um, start hiring, but it's what you do with those that you hire. And it's really being upfront and honest as to where your gaps are. Um, we recognize that we have gaps in um, designers of color. We recognize that we um, don't have women in certain um, key positions. And we're very open and honest about where the gaps are year on year and how we're going to um, fill the gaps. I think social focusing on social equity and cultural competency and tracking your mission and metrics um, are key. Again, we implemented all the conversations on race from wide at the local level. Um, it's been actually quite wonderful to hear, um, to hear people's interests and those that are willing to share, to share their stories. And so in order to build this culture and this leadership, it really means changing some behaviors and challenging the status quo. And I have a list on the left, which are some of the quote unquote norms, right? Which is checking a box, can't find um, black or brown people and the entourage, digital content. Um, we've always designed with a Eurocentric aesthetic and process. We're saying turn all of that on its head, challenge every single norm and measure it against the Jedi lens. Are you being equitable? Are you being representational? Are you mirroring the clients and society that you, clients and the communities that you work with? So I always like to leave this out here and if, you know, take it home and you think about what norms you might, that you think ought to be challenged and changed in order to advance the profession. I think visionary design solutions really needs to start with cultural competency. You know, I talked about my experience at RISD. My lived experiences were not uh, represented in my education. Um, I think that in, in today's world, if we are not at the highest level of cultural competency, which is where people unconsciously hold culture in high esteem and use this to guide their lives and work, then we, are, we will continue to do harm. We certainly can't be down at the bottom where we treat everybody the same. I think my rough opinion, I would say that our profession is somewhere between cultural blindness and cultural pre-competence. Pre and social equity, um, I think is a comprehensive look and, and understanding of how the barriers in our social 
um, makeup, social systems. I think, again, it starts with where are the inequities? Um, and the barriers of these systems, environmental protection, economic development, um, social justice, they all impact the very notion of sustainability and resiliency of, of community. And I think each of these realms, we have the opportunity to challenge the status quo and influence our clients, teams, and communities to change the course. And again, just to reiterate the importance of community as design partner, I think not only does it build buy-in, um, pride, it can give them a sense, of, give the community a sense of belonging, safety, and wellness. And just a little bit about our progress. So we've been doing this for eight years, and we've made um, quite an impact. We have become the industry leader. We've established scholarships to build the pipeline, K-12 outreach, partnerships with HBCUs. We've created internal cultural um, tools, affinity guides, affinity groups, um, equity toolkit. We've achieved pay, pay equity and gender balance and our race and ethnicity is going up. Um, we are leading the industry, um, speaking, you know, in organizations and schools like this, but we have to do more. And last summer, we made a commitment to double down, particularly in the African American community, and really focus on equity um, in community and in our work. We can all do this. We can all figure out what are we lacking and how might we get there in one step at a time. We have a, a complete metrics um, that we use to, to both measure the qualitative and quantitative um, efforts that we do. We do it annually, um, recruitment and retention, learning and development, the culture, how is our culture of diversity and inclusion, our outreach, leadership, and work-life integration. And just quickly over this, six years, we started out gender, 44 women, 44% 44 women, 56% men, we are now 50-50, and that is true for 2020 as well. We see that at a staff level, it's 55% women, and at the principal level, it's 26%. So if we continue to focus on making um, every level, every staff level, more gender balanced, then in due time, the principal level will be, the highest leadership level should be more balanced. Similarly with ethnicity and race, we have increased from 23% to 31%. But we do also know that the, the different diverse populations um, are broken down here. And we know that African-Americans, we have not increased beyond 4%. And so that's why the particular focus on, um, on outreach and building the pipeline for that particular demographic. And so this is usually my call for action slide. Um, you know, we gotta walk the walk and we have to be action oriented. We have to be active. This cannot be a moment. It must be a movement. I think, um, you know, incorporate equity into the design process, challenge the status quo, and align our values with our clients. So here's a question for you. How does your design and practice reflect social justice, cultural competency, and equity? And if you can't answer that question, you might not be addressing some of the pressing needs um, in our profession and in our society. So my vision was solid. As you can see, I didn't have a plan B. We can't ignore the impact we have on people, communities, and society. And we have a responsibility to design with these concepts in mind to transform toward a more equitable profession. 
I set out to change the world in my own way. And I challenge each of you to do the same. In John Lewis's words, find a way to get in the way and make good trouble. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Gabriel. Now you can relax. Uh, <laughs> now it has been a, a wonderful presentation, I think full of uh, intention and, and, and this super necessary critical position regarding so many issues that concern us and very especially this last question that you were pointing in the in the screen. No? I think that uh, we have been talking uh, for a while about this, this transformation or how, how can we transform our social and, and political commitments and responsibilities into design decisions. No? I think that that's a crucial, uh, crucial point, no? because of course, we as citizens can be concerned and can be engaged, but finally we are architects and we have to uh, transform uh, all these preoccupations into, into design. No? And my, my, my first question is about the routines uh, of your of your practice, of your office. Uh, I think this is Perkins and Will is a, it's a big laboratory of 2,500 people. 25. Uh, 25. 25. <laughs> uh, it's, it's okay, unless, anyway. Unless we hire a thousand people overnight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and of course, I, I, I'm sure that you have some routines in this design process, uh, some particular uh, methods of working, incorporation of teamwork, mixing young and veterans uh, uh, professionals, and also how you really, because of, of course we have, we have seen in your, in your image, how you, how you create this community engagement or what are the, the processes I really like this idea of, of the, the uh, citizens as design partners. How do you do that? I, how do you do? This is a conversation between colleagues, no? It's how right, you right, do right, it? right, how you? right. Well, there were like five questions there, but I'll start with the community engagement one because I think that one really, um, when we did it on Destination Crenshaw, and it depending on the scale of the project, right, it can be, you know, many months, many weeks, whatever, but I think for Destination Crenshaw, it was, um, we created it with them. We created the community engagement with them. You know, it, it, it was an art and um, experiential project, right? So what kind of music should we focus on? What kind of art? Which artist? What's, what are the young people doing? Um, and there are a lot of assets there. So it wasn't hard to get opinion or desires um, communicated, right? So we had several open, um, open workshops, half day workshops on different. Um, so the first one I think was about bring, bring your favorite music, bring, your, bring representation of your favorite art to get to the stories that they wanted to tell in this experience. Um, when we had some design for them to look at, it was more, a little bit, but more formal, but not, you know, we rolled out the entire drawing, we printed out on this huge thing and we'd let them mark it up. We'd let them, so you, you know, don't do that. You know, we'd rather say this or represent this. So it was just, a, it's like having another team member. Um, of course they weren't in our office every day, but we didn't make a step without, really engaging them um, every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And we started this project in 2017 and they are still engaged. So it is morphed into the art curatorial and the advisory council, which we meet with every week because now we're in the process of vetting the art and fine tuning the stories. So it's not your typical architectural project, right? Well, but this this project is I really uh, love it uh, very much uh, because uh, in terms of um, segregation uh, through urban design or architecture, I think the most dramatic chapter is uh, 
the expulsion of the urban space of so many uh, minorities and how the city has uh, cancelled and, and, and marginalized you know, um, um, the groups uh, of, of you know, races and, 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 and blackness mm -hmm. and whatever. And, and, uh, and I remember a beautiful text by uh, Dorothea from um, Hunterman who, who says that the museum is the, the new ritual space uh, of our society after being the theater, perhaps in the in the past, no. But I think that this is only a three years ago text, <laughs> but it's already old, no. Because I think the ritual space of of this transformation of of, of the society that we are living uh, today is the is the urban space, no. Is the the the, the is this the street, no. So. Yeah. Perhaps mixing these two uh, thoughts about the museum as a ritual space and the street as a, as a ritual space and your project that basically is an open air museum, no? How do you feel this space uh, will host these rituals of the everyday uh, of all these communities? And also, right. I think that this, <laughs> <laughs> we also mentioned when we talk about this project, we also mentioned these black communities of LA. But it is this 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 project is also incredibly useful for the white communities. I think the uh, white absolutely. communities are going to learn a lot about <laughs> through it just <laughs> happens to be in the black community by the black community for the black community. But yeah. I think you know the culture of this community is um, you know, when Crenshaw Boulevard was vibrant and businesses and everything people had places to gather. They had places to run into each other, you know, at the barbershop, at the cafe. So this is, I think, meant to supplement the rejuvenation of those businesses to create activity. There's no, there's no benches on that street now. There's no place to sit and talk. There's no place to gather. I think, um, and this, it's a huge, it was a huge musical, center um, for the black community. Um, major clubs were there, old clubs that had been there forever. So I think the programming is as important as, as, as what we build, right? So um, where's the pop-up trucks gonna be? Where's the food truck gonna be? So I think it's, um, it's going to enrich the bones that are already there. And it's going to bring back a lot of, and I call it, you know, the renaissance of black culture in Los Angeles. And, you know, it's happening in other cities. The other thing is that um, given the pandemic, right? What is the new model for a museum? Mm -hmm. You know, could this, something like this be it? Mm -hmm. No, I also the the not, Disgregation of the of the museum and this, you know, uh, evanescent the, condition. <laughs> yeah. The other important um, activity that's likely to happen here are gatherings for protests. Black Lives yeah. Matter. Um, mm -hmm. Political. I mean, that there's not a large um, gathering place other than in the middle of the street, right now. So at Sankofa Park at the cultural campus, we've provided opportunities for the gathering that typically happens. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And um, what about the other side of the coin? We have talked about public space and, and museums. Um, and uh, Social housing, you, you, you have shown this uh, no, work that you did as uh, your thesis, but you also were born in Harlem. <laughs> Harlem is the neighborhood uh, that I think today, in, 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 as a new as a new attitude, uh, GSAP uh, at Columbia uh, is, is, is looking as a place to learn, as, as a place mm -hmm. to understand uh, many uh, current circumstances. No? Um, and the, the projects in, in New York have this uh, incredibly uh, strong expression of uh, segregation, you no, know, with this 
buildings, even not touching the sidewalk, always behind a fence, uh, not being urban in a certain way, you know. Uh, but today there are experiments about, you know, of trying to be, I think, with a very good intention, social housing, but perhaps not achieving the, the results or, or the goals that we would like. What, what, what do you think about? What, what is your, what your I comment? Th well, I, I think a very simple comment is, if we design housing in a vacuum, if we design housing without understanding what the community that's going to live there needs, wants, what's going to build them up, strengthen them, then it's likely to fail. I think that, um, you know, penetration of activity around housing, I think is very important, particularly in, in New York. I don't know how much open space there are anymore. I mean, one of the old pictures of the housing projects had plenty of open space, but it was, you know, there was nothing in it. There was just mm -hmm. a fence around it. So um, I think activity is, is what's exciting to me about housing. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a wall, if it doesn't come, if it's not penetrable um, at the ground floor, the ground two floors, you know, then it's a wall. Yeah. <laughs> The division, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, I think this, this is this is important because it's, it's super close to our school, and we see it uh, every day. And and I think that as architects, uh, the vision of these projects has changed a lot in the last uh, few years. Not 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 more, <laughs> perhaps no. And and it's is important. Let let us talk about. Uh, Perkins and Will, no. Uh, how I think it. We are not wrong if we say that historically, big firms uh, have been characterized characterized by staying out of certain sensitivities. But today, uh, I think some of them, a few of them, or perhaps most of them, uh, have understood. Or have assumed that that it, it is impossible to stay out of, out of these discussions, no? And of course, you have shown these graphics where finally we can get the conclusion that even it's it's beneficial for the company and it's good for everyone, no? But how do you think these big firms can have a kind of impact in the discipline? Can help the, the 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 profession to to change and to and to understand that innovation or experimentation is 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 really good no? because mm -hmm. th these were attitudes more that we associate to a small offices but perhaps with not a very big impact no so it's a big effort so what young generations are doing to to achieve this this is these goals but the impact that they they can they can produce right. is not that big. But you but you can you 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 have the, the this this power. How how do you see that? No? Well, I think um, a couple of things. One, because we are a large firm, we may have some resources and ability to focus on this, and that's why our goal was to share what we do. It's not just for Perkins and Well, right? Because mm -hmm. we want to we want to advance the entire industry. And so I think as a large firm, we have sort of a responsibility to lead the way and mm -hmm. share what we can and help those and not. And believe it or not, it's become a sort of competitive edge amongst our competitors and clients mm -hmm. even. You know, more and more of our clients are wanting to know what's our position, what's our culture um, around Jedi if you will. So I don't think there's going to be too many institutional clients, civic clients um, that won't be talking about this, that won't be requiring um, um, a focus on equity uh, representation and such. Good. And um, we have a couple of questions from the audience related to, to this. No, One is, uh, how, 
what strategy can we use to promote black architects have to change the key players in firms like yours, no? Thinking that the, the percentage is, is still low in many companies or in other companies, no? How are you, what, what have you done to, 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 to get all these uh, black architects right. incorporated to the, to the firm? And, and what do you do to, to increase every day mm -hmm. this, this representation? Well, it's, um, it's an ongoing effort, right? We have to build the pipeline from which to hire from, right? Mm -hmm. So that means exposure to architecture, to youth, right? It means scholarships. It means financial support. It's, it's a very expensive profession. And so there's plenty of barriers, right? Um, so I think what we're doing, we have several scholarships that we've developed. We um, are partnering with HBCUs for recruitment and mentoring and, um, and all of that. So I think those are two really key um, components. I think our engagement and partnership with NOMA, National Organization of Mining Architects, um, is very good. And, and they have a strong, strong connection through their pipeline camp. So I think all of those things is, is to build the pool and not just to have more black architects, but to, to represent um, in what we do every day, what different cultures bring to our profession, right? So I think it starts there. And then, um, you know, folks come to us, reach out to us because they see, they see, them, they see themselves in our firm. If they can see themselves, I don't care if it's a woman, or African-American or Latinx, if they can see themselves in your organization, then they're gonna to wanna to be there. But if they can't, then they're gonna, you know, question whether or not it's the right place for them. Yeah, well, uh, you, you have been, I think from, from, your, from your years at, at RISD, <laughs> um, you have been there, the first in, in, in many things, no? And, you know, the first woman, the first black first woman. First one, only one, the only one in the room, yeah, all that. All that, no? <laughs> and, but, but, but also now and, and in, in all your, your, along your professional career, you, 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 you belong to countless associations and, 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 no, and, and groups of uh, touch forces uh, as a public uh, activist, uh, as, a, as a public architect, Activist or activist architect. Um, <laughs> what and, and and of course we admire you in, in, in for this, no? And and and, and, and this is a, it's a wonderful uh, generosity from your side. Um, you have one minute now to convince okay. <laughs> all the students to to take uh, no to fight. And, and, and to take uh, uh, an activist position uh, as, as architects, not, not only as citizens, that's of course, uh, yeah. all we suppose that we are at, as architects in terms of uh, professionals trying to demonstrate that architecture can be a relevant uh, instrument to achieve equity, diversity, inclusion, justice, all, all these mm -hmm. four words that you repeat constantly. Yeah, well, I. Convince them, huh? Okay. I think, <laughs> I think if we look at what we saw last year in this country, yeah. the protests, the division, um, it's caused in many ways by us not addressing um, some systemic challenges that we've had in this country. And so we can't unsee that. So I think now is the time to reset, to um, to talk about it and to come up with some ideas to address them because this ain't rocket science, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about um, addressing human need um, in communities. And I don't care if it's a hospital or a destination Crenshaw, but I don't think we can afford to design in a vacuum. And I think that's been changing for some time, but I think um, I challenge all the students to 
to make a commitment to, um, to ask questions, to explore, to challenge um, everything. Yeah. That we, you know, we stay in our lane way too much. Mm -hmm. That's why we have zoning codes that, you know, um, created redlining or, you know, I mean, it's, it's been there for years and we tell her that's just the way it is. Not necessarily redlining, but what's come after that, right? So I say, get out of your lane. Mm -hmm. be, be nosy. Go find out what the, um, you know, how's that developer you're working with? Are they a no negative gentrifier? Do you mm -hmm. want to perpetuate that? So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we have to fight. That's clear. Uh, yeah. there, there is there is a question from the audience that is also interesting. Is uh, it's about the 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 changes in in your company in terms of of diversity and inclusion? This this beautiful department that you lead. Uh, you and you have shown this statistic data showing how uh, your department has you know, transformed the, the, the social map of the, of the company. But what about the company's culture? What, uh, what you, how, how you transform, how you understand that this statistic, statistical data is changing the, the everyday culture of the- Right, I would say that, um, I'd say two years ago, it was clear to me and us that the studios, the offices were embracing it. They were coming up with their own initiatives around the, the, um, around the diversity umbrella. But it, it's more recently within the, within the last year where it's been reflected in our work and in our teams in a, in a, in a very, um, open way, and we're talking about it more. So for me, that was the um, that was the that was the next big thing that I wanted to see happen was conversations about how does this work with our work, right? Culture is one thing. You have to you know get the culture and the behaviors and all of that to to some degree. But I was very anxious all along. When are we going to be able to talk about these things? and to see how they play out in our designs um, moving forward. And I think we're seeing it that now, we're seeing it by the work that we are being asked to do, the commissions that we are being selected for, um, and even in you know, just a university project, they wanna know how to create a cultural framework for their campus. So, yeah. Happening. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. I think this is a is a, is a good closing note. Uh, I think we can we can leave here, and I have to say thank you very much. Thank you very much for bringing this hope to <laughs> architecture to be to be relevant and 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 to to help us so much to to have a better living together. All we have to live together. Yes. That's thank you very much. That's the destination. Thank you. <laughs> thank um, you. Come back soon, please. I'll be back. Okay. Yes. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.